Jinkies! Chances are, at some point in the course of your lifetime, you were really into Scooby-Doo. Nearly 30 years after the first episode of Scooby-Doo Where Are You premiered, a direct-to-video movie was released in 1998 and changed the fate of the franchise forever. Hi, I'm Adrian with Channel Frederator, and I'm here to give you the quick scoop on all the craze surrounding Moonscar Island. It's zombies and Simone Lenoir. So chow down on those Scooby snacks, sit back, and enjoy these seven facts about Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island. <laughs> Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island is a direct-to-video animated movie based on Hanna-Barbera's Scooby-Doo franchise. The movie was released on VHS on September 22, 1998, and aired on Cartoon Network on Halloween of 1999. The movie follows the Mystery Inc. a year after they split up to pursue their own respective career paths. Fred and Daphne are running an investigative TV show, Velma's running a bookstore, and Scooby and Shaggy were working at an airport, but just got fired for eating too much food. Fred calls up everyone and arranges a plan to go down to New Orleans to celebrate Daphne's birthday and, of course, solve a mystery. The gang of sleuths gets more than they bargained for when they're invited to Moonscar Island in the Louisiana Bayou and find themselves against undead werecats and a swarm of zombies. Sorry, that's a pretty big spoiler, and I suppose I should have dropped a spoiler alert warning there. Whatever, let's get back to the facts. The 1960s were a huge decade for Hanna-Barbera. The Flintstones, The Yogi Bear Show, Top Cat, The Jetsons, Johnny Quest, Space Ghost, Wacky Races, and Scooby-Doo Where Are You were all released in that short window of 10 years. The show has featured some of the most iconic cartoon characters of all time, but none have remained as relevant today as Scooby-Doo. Even though the franchise started as a TV series, a large chunk of Scooby-Doo's staying power can be attributed to the constant stream of direct-to-video movies, which all started with Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island. The movie kickstarted a complete revival of the franchise, and we're still seeing the effects of it today. Prior to Zombie Island, there hadn't been much going on for Scooby-Doo and company, and there weren't any new Scooby cartoons until the TV movie Scooby-Doo in Arabian Nights premiered in 1994. Things were looking dark for Mystery Inc., but then Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island happened. Since its release, there have been a constant stream of Scooby content with four animated TV series, two live-action theatrical films, two live-action TV movies, an animated film set to release in 2020, and at least one new direct-to-video movie per year since 1998. With a grand total of 26 movies, we're averaging a new Scooby-Doo direct-to-video movie every nine months since 1998. The movies have taken Mystery Inc. to Transylvania, Australia, and everywhere in between. Along the way, the gangs also teamed up with the Blue Falcon, Kiss, and the WWE twice. Who knows where the next adventure will take Mystery Inc., but I'm excited to find out. The story goes that Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island is based off an unfinished episode of SWAT Cats, The Radical Squadron. For those who weren't alive in the 90s, first off, wow, I'm feeling pretty old now. But SWAT Cats was an animated series about a pair of anthropomorphic vigilante cats who piloted a state-of-the-art fighter jet to fight crime and corruption in Mega Cat City. It was really cool, trust me. The show only ran for two seasons with a total of 23 episodes, and 13 of them were written by former Hanna-Barbera writer Glenn Leopold. Other episodes had been in the works, but SWAT Cats was ultimately cancelled before they were finished. Of the unfinished episodes, there was one called Succubus, although it's only been referred to as the Curse of Cataluna. In the episode, one of the SWAT cats fell in love with a woman who was a succubus, and she attempted to drain his life force. Anthropomorphic cats draining the lives of heroes? Is this starting to sound a little familiar yet? Hopefully yes, because as it just so happens, Len Leopold also wrote the story and screenplay for Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island. It's technically unconfirmed, but come on, the plot is too similar to be a coincidence. Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island marked a big change for the Scooby-Doo franchise, as the movie features practically an all-new voice cast for Mystery Inc. The movie's dedicated to Don Messick, the original voice of Scooby-Doo, who died nearly a year before the movie came out. As such, Scott Innes replaced Messick as the voice of Scooby. Innes went on to reprise the role of Scooby-Doo up until he was replaced by Frank Welker in 2002's reboot of the series, What's New Scooby-Doo? Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island was also the first time Shaggy was voiced by anyone other than Casey Kasem, although for a much different reason. Casey Kasem was a devout vegetarian, and in 1995 quit the role of Shaggy after he was asked to voice the character in a Burger King commercial. To fill the role of Shaggy, Warner Brothers hired Billy West. Unfortunately for West, this was the first and last time he voiced Shaggy, as he was ultimately replaced by Scott Innes. And unfortunately for Scott Innes, in 2002, Kasem returned to voice Shaggy after the producers agreed Shaggy would also be vegetarian. 2002 was a rough year for Scott Innes. Mary Kay Bergman replaced Heather North Kenny as the voice of Daphne Blake and continued to provide the voice of Daphne for the next two direct-to-video Scooby-Doo movies until ultimately being replaced by Gray Delisle, and B.J. Ward replaced Pat Stevens as the voice of Velma Dinkley. And last but not least, Fred Jones was voiced by Frank Welker, who's voiced Fred Jones in every iteration of Scooby-Doo since the first episode of Scooby-Doo Where Are You? Here's another fun fact, Adrian Burbeau played the role of Catwoman on Batman the Animated Series, and in Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island, she voiced Simone Lenoir, the villainess who is literally a Catwoman. I know it's completely unrelated to Mystery Inc., but it's too fun a fact to pass up while we're on the topic of voice acting. This is the first Scooby-Doo adventure where the monsters, ghosts, and zombies that the 
Mystery Gang encounter are real. In the original series, Scooby-Doo, Where Are You?, most of the creatures were often just people in costumes that they would use to scare locals and obtain something for their own personal gain. There's something philosophical here about how Scooby-Doo taught us the real monsters in this world are greedy and selfish humans, but we don't have time to get into that. One other monster had previously appeared in the 80s Scooby-Doo series, but this continuity was ignored when the movie trailers and characters themselves said they were encountering real monsters for the first time. A moment of silence for the Yeti of Tibet. I'll never forget you, even if those meddling kids have. With the direct-to-DVD movies, Leopold explained that Warner Brothers wasn't sure what Hanna-Barbera characters they wanted to cover first. When they heard that it was Scooby-Doo, Leopold began thinking of ideas for the film, going from vampires to a ghost ship and eventually landing on swamps and zombies, and pirates hiding loot in bayous. The twist came when Leopold thought, but what if the zombies were not only real, but ended up being the good guys, trying to warn our heroes, not harm them? And thus, the story was born. There's even one part in the movie where Daphne says she gave up detective work because it got boring since it was always just the bad guy in a mask. The movie was aware of the formulaic shortcomings of the show, and that's pretty cool. Which is why, this time, the zombies of Zombie Island are 100% real. There's a scene where a zombie creeps up on Mystery Inc., and Fred attempts to unmask the zombie, thinking it's just another hoax. In another tongue-in-cheek joke to the original series, he yells out, IT'S THE FERRYMAN! as he tries to pull off what he expects to be a zombie mask. He notices the mask seems to be really on there, so Fred does what any sane individual would do, and pulls harder, until he accidentally decapitates the zombie. This isn't your grandmother's Scooby-Doo. We got Fred out here popping the heads off zombies. Which is why when the movie came out, some kids under three were horrified to learn that the monsters were real this time, and not bad behaving humans in a mask. The older kids got it though. Monsters are still not real, even though they are in this cartoon. So this was the movie that opened the door to including real monsters into the series, and the franchise has done so many times ever since. Leopold explained that Warner Brothers never paid much attention to what he and producer Davis Doy were doing with the property, and gave them a good amount of creative freedom. So not only did they introduce real monsters, they also had the gang grow up, split up, and each were off doing their own thing. For example, Velma owned her own mystery bookshop, and Daphne was a TV host, while Fred was her cameraman. Speaking of which, Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island is the first Scooby-Doo production that alludes to a romantic relationship between Fred and Daphne. Throughout the franchise, everyone was always thinking it, but the most we ever saw from the two were dancing in a couple episodes of Scooby-Doo Where Are You? In the Johnny Bravo episode Bravo Dooby Doo, there was also a joke about how Fred and Daphne always seemed to split up together, but other than that, nothing too obvious. That is, of course, until Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island. In the movie, Fred starts to show feelings for Lena Dupree, which makes Daphne jealous, and when Daphne does the same for the gardener, Beau Neville, Fred becomes jealous. Fred and Daphne's feelings wouldn't be revealed explicitly for another 15 years until 2013's movie Scooby-Doo Stage Fright. In the movie, Daphne confesses to Velma that she's in love with Fred, the two sing a love song together, and then they kiss. So yeah, it might have taken a while, but Zombie Island started it all. Almost 20 years later, Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island is still regarded as one of the best Scooby-Doo movies. Trust me, it's good. Fans loved how dark the movie was, and it still holds up after all these years. Fans loved how scary the movie was because it was a departure from the overall campiness of the original series run. Don't get me wrong, Scooby-Doo Where Are You is fantastic, but the 90s were full of angst and the cheesy villain reveals were too wholesome for the decade. The movie marked a departure from Scooby-Doo Where Are You's original message of monsters aren't real, and shifted to a message of, you kids want monsters? We'll give you monsters. The zombies and werecats genuinely seem to scare fans, with some still terrified to this day. MTV dubbed the werecats the scariest villains from the whole franchise, and that's genuinely impressive when you consider some of the competition. Seriously, just look at the ghost clown. MTV saw a scoopified version of Pennywise and said, yeah, that's creepy and all, but have you seen these werecats from Zombie Island? Once again, I'm Adrian, and thanks for watching our seven facts about Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island. Which one did you find the most interesting? Is there any info we missed that deserves a spotlight? Let us know in the comments below. We have new videos dropping every day, so let us know what you want us to cover next. Don't forget to click that bell icon to become part of the notification squad. Be sure to subscribe to Channel Frederator, and remember, Frederator loves you.